Good morning. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter 6. And we'll start uh, by reading just the last couple of verses of chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk In newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that you have atoned for the sins of your people, Lord, that you chose us, purchased us, called us, and that you've accomplished salvation. Lord, we thank you that in all things your will is done, and we know that as we head into the new year, All things will be done according to thy will, and we're thankful for that, Lord. We cannot add or take away from your word, from your accomplishments. Lord, we confess that we're sinful and wicked, but that uh, your, your son is holy. Lord, we ask that in the coming weeks you would prepare the men who are going to speak here. We are thankful that you give us a time and place to come together and worship you, Lord. We ask that you would enable us to do that and and that you would prepare not only those men, Lord, but our hearts and ears to receive your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 158 from the hardback hymnal, 158. Let's stand together. Ah. 
Isaac Watts was taught of God. The things that he expressed in that hymn are exactly the things that I experience. <clears throat> I was thinking in light of the first hour's message about John Newton, the uh, author of Amazing Grace. He said toward the very end of his life, he said, when I was a young man, I knew a lot of things. He said, now in my latter days, and mine's not what it used to be, he said, I only know two things for sure. First, that I'm a great sinner, and second, that Christ Jesus is a great Savior. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's, uh, I hope the Lord will enable us to Remember those things if we forget everything else. I'm a great sinner. Christ Jesus is a great Savior. If you'd like to open your Bibles with me, we're going to begin in Second, First Samuel. I'm sorry, First Samuel chapter 20. First Samuel chapter 20. I've titled this message, Fetching Grace. Fetching Grace. I need God to fetch me. So prone to wander, so prone to leave the God I love. We need the Lord to send his spirit in power to fetch us to the king's table and bring us back to feast on the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. If the Lord doesn't fetch us, if he leaves us to ourselves, we'll wander away completely. Of what a merciful God we have, that he never lets his children fall. He, he leaves the 90 and 9, he goes out after the one, he always, he always brings them in. He said, I'll, I'll not lose one of my sheep. I'll not lose one. That's our Lord's promise. <clears throat> We'll begin this message by reading a few verses in 1 Samuel chapter 20. Those of you that have been with us in our study of 1 Samuel know about David and Jonathan and how uh, Saul was uh, pursuing out of, out of jealousy to have David put to death because of David's popularity among the people. God was with David and God was not with Saul. Saul was a king. And uh, Saul was afraid that David was going was to take his throne. God had already anointed David to be Saul's successor. Saul's days had already been numbered. And Jonathan, Saul's son, knew that. Jonathan would have been the successor of Saul's throne as the son of the king. And yet God knit Jonathan's heart together with David's. And a couple chapters ago, you remember that we saw that David and Jonathan made a covenant. They made a promise to one another to, to protect one another and to be on one another's side regardless of what happened, regardless of what Saul did. And now Saul's rage has become more and more unreasonable. And uh, he's pursuing David with, uh, with great zeal and anger. And Jonathan gets word of it, and Jonathan goes and warns David. And Jonathan hides David from his father. And now, Jonathan and David come back together in verse 14 of chapter 20. And Jonathan says to David, and thou shalt not only yet while I live 
show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not. I shall not only while I live, yet show me the kindness of the Lord. We already made a covenant that we would stick together and protect one another from my father. But now I want to extend this covenant to my descendants. Not only do you need to promise to me that you'll, that you'll remain faithful to me, but also, verse 15, thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. In other words, David, when your kingdom is established and all of your enemies are destroyed, remember my descendants, remember my children. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. In other words, David, if you're not faithful to this covenant, let the Lord raise up your enemies against you. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Now we're going to look at David and Jonathan and Jonathan's descendant, Mephibosheth, as the fulfillment of this covenant promise. Look at the last verse before we move to 2 Samuel. Look at the last verse of this chapter, verse 42. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. We cannot look at these verses without considering. 2 Samuel chapter 9, so we'll go there. 2 <clears throat> Samuel chapter 9. Saul and Jonathan are dead. God has prospered David. His kingdom has been established and all of his enemies have been subdued. He had the right as king to eliminate any threat that might be left over from the previous regime. So Jonathan could have been rightfully put to death as a threat to the security of David's reign. Because, I mean, not Jonathan, but Jonathan's children. And in particular, Mephibosheth, only one left. Only one left. And, uh, and so we pick up the story here. David's going to remember the covenant that he made with Jonathan. And uh, as we read this story, I, I read a, probably the most prolific writer of the early 1700s um, that wrote a lot of things that are true about, about the gospel. He was probably the last of the Puritans. And I read all the comments that he made on 2 Samuel chapter 9. He made not a single mention of Christ, the covenant of grace, um, the fetching of sinners, uh, the, the, the picture of, of Mephibosheth being a type of you and me and Jonathan being a type of Christ. And David being a type of God the Father, uh, who's going to show mercy towards the descendants of, of Jonathan because of the covenant that David had made with him. And I thought, you know, that, that we, we've seen this so many times in looking at these Old Testament stories. If we don't see the gospel, we don't see Christ, we haven't, we haven't profited from God's word at all. Uh, these are they which testify of me. 
Uh, we, we must look at these stories as pictures of what God would fulfill in the person of his son. I remind you that the apostles and the Lord Jesus himself only had the Old Testament scriptures to preach from. <laughs> they didn't have the New Testament. And yet you read some of these old writers and they didn't see the gospel in the Old Testament. Other than a few verses which they called messianic. They didn't know the whole Bible was messianic. They didn't know that it was all about him. So I pray that the Holy Spirit would enlighten the eyes of our understanding and enable us to see ourselves in Mephibosheth and see Christ in Jonathan and see God the Father in David. 2 Samuel chapter 9, David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David was very secure in his reign. He knew that God had put him there. And he knew that there was no threat uh, from anyone. He, as I said, he had the right to eliminate John, uh, Mephibosheth. But instead he reflects back on that covenant that he made. And he says, is there anyone left from the household of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is, is he. And David said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan yet has a son, hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the house, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. And that's where the title of this message comes from, God's Fetching Grace. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said unto Mephibosheth, and he answered, uh, David said, Mephibosheth. I can just see the tone and the facial expression of King David when he looked at Jonathan's son and saw the image of Jonathan in Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth walks into the room. David loved Mephibosheth as his own soul. We just read that. And David saw Mephibosheth and said, Oh, Mephibosheth. <laughs> oh, Mephibosheth. Either you are the son of Jonathan. <clears throat> and Mephibosheth responded by saying, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. Don't you know Mephibosheth thought that Ziba had come and got him and they discovered him? He's hiding out is what he was doing. And, uh, and bringing him to the king to have him put to death. The first words out of David's mouth is, fear not. Don't be afraid, Mephibosheth. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to save you. Don't be afraid. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul. Now Saul was the king. Saul had vast lands and possessions and servants. And now he's given it all back to Mephibosheth. <laughs> I 
I have given unto him thy master's son, all that pertaineth to Saul and all and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruit, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy servant, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. And the fourth time this is mentioned in this one brief chapter. For he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame in both his feet. What was the cause of David's kindness toward Mephibosheth? You say, well, it was that covenant that Jonathan and David had made. And that's true. Before time ever was, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit before the angels were made, before there was any any eternal covenant, an eternally past, God made a covenant with his son. And in that covenant, God the Father promised to give to his son a bride. God the Son entered into that covenant and promised to redeem those whom the Father had given him. God the Holy Spirit entered into that covenant and promised to make all those whom the Father had chosen and all those for whom Christ had redeemed to give them faith and make them willing in the day of his power. There's our hope. The hope of our salvation is not dependent upon the faithfulness of our promises to God. It's God's promise to God. And Our God cannot lie. (laughs) Is there any way that the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God God the Son and God the Holy Spirit could fail in fulfilling that covenant? No way. You see, Adam was put under a covenant of works when he was put in the garden. But the covenant of grace was long before the covenant of works. And God, knowing that Adam would not be able to keep the covenant of grace, (laughs) uh, the covenant of works, put Adam under that covenant so that God would glorify himself in fulfilling his own covenant that he had made in the salvation of his people. So that covenant is the, the cause of David's Kindness toward Mephibosheth. He said, I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. But don't miss this, brethren, because if all we see is the covenant, then we're prone to make this nothing more than a legal contract. We're prone to make this nothing more than God being obligated by by a a covenant promise that he made uh, to fulfill. What was the reason for the covenant? Because that's the first cause of our salvation. The covenant itself came about as a result of something else. Why did Jonathan and David make a covenant? Because they loved one another. They loved one another. And that is the first cause of our salvation. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. 
It's the love of Christ that constraineth us. It's not the threats of judgment. It's not some fulfilling of just a legal contract. God made that covenant promise out of love. The father's love for his son and love for all those that he placed in his son by election. He loved them. I was talking to a friend in another country this past week and and he said to me, young man, he said to me, he said, I've met the love of my life. I said, what's her name? He said, Anna. I said, will you tell Anna that if she loves you, we already love her before we ever met her. You tell her that. And we look forward to meeting her. And uh, isn't that the way it is? You know, ideally, when a, when a child marries, we don't lose a son or a daughter. We gain a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law, don't we? That's, that's in a loving home. That's the way it works. Um, and, uh, and that's the way it worked in this covenant. The father looks at his son and he loves his son perfectly, wholly, infinitely. And he loves all those that he placed in his son in the same way that he loves his son. That's what our Lord said when he prayed to his father in John chapter 7. He said, Father, you've loved them even as you've loved me. <laughs> I pray not for the world. I pray for them which thou hast given me out of the world. That's the first cause of our salvation, brethren. It is the love of God. And the greatest evidence and demonstration of God's love is on full display at Calvary's cross. That's where we see the evidence of God's love. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation of our sins. For God so loved that he gave. Here is the evidence that the Lord Jesus Christ, no man took his life from him. He gave, he laid his life down. And no greater love hath no man than this, than he, than he lay his life down for his friend. We have a friend. We have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And he loves us infinitely. And it's the love of God that constraineth us. It's the goodness of God that God uses in the message of the gospel as fetching grace. It's not, it's not threats of judgment or anger or, or, or threats of hell. That's not, that's not the way that God draws his... Those things are true. God's angry with the wicked every day. And hell's a reality. But he doesn't use that threat for his children. He, he causes them to see the evidence of his love for them. And it is his love for them that breaks their heart. It is his love for them that draws them out. It is his love for them that causes them to come and love him because he first loved them. Is that not true? And let us resist the thought of making God to be altogether such a one as ourselves. Our love is so inconsistent, it's so fickle, it's so filled with love, with, with selfishness. Now, you've seen this, I've seen it. People that are head over heels in love with one another at the marriage altar become each other's worst enemy at the judge's bench. That's the way our love is, isn't it? It can come and go. And it can turn. Not God's love. Not God's love. <laughs> our God's immutable. His love doesn't change. He loves one way. He loves perfectly. He loves, he loves infinitely. He loves completely. And there's nothing that you and I can do to change that. 
We can't. You know, we, we sin against one another and there comes a point where we say, you know what, I can't deal with that anymore. God, God never does that. <laughs> he keeps loving, keeps forgiving. He keeps fetching. David said to Ziba, he said, go fetch him. I'm so thankful that the Lord's fetching grace is faithful and consistent and that his love never changes because that's what I need every day. I need him to fetch me. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, he wasn't just fulfilling covenant promises. Yes, God was doing business with God. And yes, those promises that were made in the covenant of grace had to be fulfilled. A sacrifice had to be made in order for those God that had elected to be saved. But that was the result of something else. And that something else was God's love. It was the love of God that caused Christ to go to the cross. The second thing I see in this story, beyond the cause of fetching grace, is the person of fetching grace. The person of fetching grace. And in our story, his name is Ziba. And he's no lowly servant. We just read in this chapter that he had 15 sons and 20 servants. Perhaps Ziba, <coughs> I suspect that Ziba knew where Mephibosheth was the whole time. He was Saul's number one servant. He had authority over the household of Saul. Maybe he was protecting Mephibosheth. Maybe he thought, you know, there come a day when David's going to die, Mephibosheth's going to take the throne, and I get my position back. I don't know what Ziba was thinking. But Ziba in our story is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Well, God the Father says, go get him. Go get him. And Paul said this, speaking of his experience on the road to Damascus. He said, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. There comes a day when the spirit of God fulfills his part in the covenant of grace out of love for his father and love for the son. Out of, he, he goes out and he makes those whom the Father elected and those who the Son redeemed, he makes them willing. What a glorious day it is. And the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and makes it effectual to our hearts. The Spirit of God can't be resisted. Can't be resisted. He's irresistible. The Lord Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But when he comes, he will convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me. And when the Holy Spirit comes to your heart and to my heart, he causes us to see that I, the root of our problem is our unbelief, our rebellion against God. It's saying, God, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have it my way. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to submit. I'm going to, I'm going to raise my fist to heaven going to have it my way the spirit of God says no not going to be that way and he makes us to be a sinner and he causes us to see our unbelief and then he causes us to see that all our righteousness is in heaven of righteousness because I go to my father when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended back into glory and took his rightful place at the right hand of the majesty on high the Father said, sit thou here at my right hand until I make all thy enemies thy footstool. And the Lord Jesus Christ is seated and all of his people are seated in him, in heavenly places in Christ, so that we have no righteousness of our own, but God has made him, God has made him sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is our righteousness. David said, I will speak of thy righteousness, even of thine only. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's a work of the Spirit of God. I've said this before. I think I said it last Sunday. All the unrighteous of this world, without exception, believe themselves to be righteous. All the unbelievers believe that they have something that will recommend them to God. Something that they can present to God. I mean, the guy, the guy in the lowest place in prison can find another prisoner that's worse than he is. I've been there. I know that. You know, at least I hadn't done what he's done. <laughs> all the unrighteous believe themselves to be righteous. And all the righteous... All those who have a true righteousness in Christ believe themselves to be unrighteous. They believe they have no righteousness outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a work of the Spirit of God. That's what Ziba did when he fetched Mephibosheth and brought him to the king. He showed him the righteousness of the king and of judgment because I because the prince of this world has been judged. David said, Mephibosheth, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't be afraid. I'm not here to hurt you. All my enemies have been eliminated. My, king, my kingdom is unthreatened. God has established my kingdom. I'm not, I'm not worried about you or anybody else. I'm resting perfectly. And you know, that's why when we read about the kingdom of David in the New Testament and the Jews wanting to reestablish the kingdom of David because it was only during the reign of David and a little bit of Solomon's reign that Israel had any peace. Israel was the dominant nation of the world during the reign of David and Solomon and only then. Before that and after that, they were under somebody else's authority. So they saw David's reign as the, as the kingdom to be and that's what this Lord Jesus as the son of David, he has no enemies. He has no, he's not threatened. He, he's, not, he's not worried about somebody taking his throne. God's established him. God has set him down. And so he's able to say to his children, I love you. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to hurt you. My enemies have been destroyed. When the Lord Jesus bowed his mighty head on the cross, he said, when he said, it's finished, Father, into thy the works of the devil were destroyed. God's people were delivered. Sin was put away once and for all. Righteousness was established. Sentence has been made. All we're waiting for now is the execution of that sentence when he'll be chained and thrown into the pit and Hmm. Spirit of God. He makes you a sinner. He makes you to see where all your righteousness is. And he makes you to see that the kingdom of God is established. It's established by God. And what God has done, as we saw in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we know that whatever God doeth, you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. Why? Because God did it that we might fear him. The fetching grace of the Spirit of God is effectual and it is irresistible. When God says to the tax collector, Matthew, follow me, and immediately he got up from his table and he followed after Christ. <laughs> when God said to Saul of Tarsus, when he asked him, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. Jesus whom thou persecutest. Oh, Lord, what would you have me to do? The, 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 the conviction of the Spirit of God is effectual. It cannot be resisted. It's only for God's people. So the cause of fetching grace is the covenant established on love. The person of fetching grace is the Holy Spirit. And he is the third person of the triune Godhead. The object 
of, 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 of fetching grace is Mephibosheth here in our story. What is his position? Well, he was the son of Jonathan. You know, the Bible refers to the people of God as the sons of God. People of the world, they, they will say, well, everybody's a child of God. No, they're not. Not by adoption, by creation, but not by adoption. By adoption, only those that are in Christ are the children of God. To as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Not everybody's a son of God. Is there anyone left from the household of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Well, Jonathan's got a son. And David saw Jonathan and said, Oh, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. You're the child of the one whom I loved. And I'm not going to lose any of my children. I love the story of David being in battle against the Philistines. And, and he leaves the wives and children of all of his men and himself in a town called Ziklag. And they defeat the Philistines, but they come back to be reunited to their families. And at a distance, they see that Ziklag has been set on fire. And all they see is smoke on the horizon. And when they get to Ziklag, there's not a single person there. They're all gone. And David's men wanted to kill him. And the scripture says that David comforted himself in the Lord. He prayed to God, Lord, what do I do? And the Lord sent him a messenger to tell him where they had taken the wives and children. And to make a long story short, David pursued his wives and his children and the last phrase in that story is, and David recovered all. Not a single child, not a single wife was lost. He recovered every one of them. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, the scripture says not a hoof was left behind. Not a hoof. Every single Israelite and their animals came out of Egypt. Nothing was left behind. And so it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. He fetches every one of his children. He saved them all. And he will bring all of them to himself. Turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. This was right after, I mentioned this, I think, in the first hour. This was right after Lazarus is raised from the dead. And the scripture says that those people that observed that miracle, some of them believed, some of them ran back and told the Pharisees. And now the Pharisees get together. And Caiaphas is the high priest. And so in chapter 11, verse 49... And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Caiaphas now, thinking that he's giving the, the Sanhedrin his wisdom, God puts words in his mouth. And God says, don't you know that one man must die for the nation so that all of the children of God in Israel and uh, that are scattered abroad in Samaria and Judea and uttermost parts of the world, all the children of God 
shall be saved. The objects of God's fetching grace are his children. They're his children. And we love our children. What parent would not gladly lay down their life for their child? And if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, you Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Oh, his love for us is infinitely more than ours could ever be for our own children. Where was Mephibosheth? Well, the scripture says that he was in the house of Mater. Now, Mater translated means sold. Sold. And that's where God finds his children. He finds them sold under sin. Slaves to sin. In bondage and in prison to sin. A prison that they cannot break themselves loose from. They're in the house of nature. They have been sold. They were sold by their father Adam. They came into this world with a nature that was bound to sin. They could do nothing but sin. And they remain slaves to it. And that's where God, you say, well, I'm not a slave to sin. I can quit that anytime I want. I can change. You might be able to quit a bad habit. No question about that. People do that all the time. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about stop being a sinner. We're talking about the ability to believe God, to trust Christ. And no sinner has that capacity. Why? Because they've been sold. Paul said, the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus, I'm free. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to set the prisoner free. To take those who have been sold of sin and fetch them and bring them to the king's table. And that's exactly what Ziba does. That's what David does. He goes to, he goes to Machir and he gets him. First Kings chapter 21, Elijah's talking to Ahab. And Ahab says, you have found me. And Elijah says, yeah, I found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. That's where we are. Everything about us, as long as we're in nature, as long as we're not sitting at the king's table, everything about us is evil. <laughs> what? Don't you love Job's declaration when, when, when God finally reveals himself to Job? Job's first thing out of his mouth. Behold, I see something I've never seen before. I am vile. When Daniel saw the Lord, he said, my corrupt, my, my comeliness, my strength, my beauty, those things that I thought were good have been turned into corruption. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, I live among the people of unclean lips, my eyes have seen the king, I'm a dead man. I was in, I'm in nature, I'm a slave, I'm sold, I need someone to come set me free. I, I, can't, I can't loose myself from this. The Lord Jesus Christ came to set the prisoner free. But the natural man won't come to that conclusion. You see, all three of those examples I just gave were examples of believers. The natural man will say, I'm not, I'm not a slave to sin. I can, I can decide for God anytime I want. I'll choose Jesus on my deathbed. I'll give my heart to him when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm finished enjoying all the pleasures of this life. That's what I'll do. No, you won't. 
No, you won't. You can't. You're sold. You're slave. You're in bondage. You can't change that. God's got to change it. We live by nature in nature. And only God can make us to believe that. And if you believe that, it's because you've been taught of God. <laughs> if you're still raising your fist to heaven and say, well, that's not me, you haven't been taught of God. As soon as God makes you to be a sinner, you at the same time have been made a saint. <laughs> and notice also in our text, not only was he a mature, which translated means sold, but he was in the land of Lodabar, which translated means not a pasture. There's no food in Lodabar. It's a desert place. It's a wilderness. There's no bread in Lodabar. Oh, we, like the prodigal, have been feeding on the husk that the swine do eat. Until, until Ziba comes to us in that pig pen and says to us, changes our mind and says to us, oh, in my father's house, if I could just be a servant in my father's house, and he turns our hearts and makes us to go home. We live by nature in Lodabar. We're like the Ethiopian eunuch in Gaza, and Gaza translated means stronghold. It was a desert place. And he was reading the Bible, but he had no understanding. And in religion, that's where many of God's people he calls out of religion. A lot of the children of God he calls out of religion. He lets them experience that. And they show them the difference. But they're like, the, they're like the Ethiopian eunuch. They're reading the Bible, but they don't know what it means. Understand this, what thou readest? How can I? <laughs> How can I? And, and, an, and an unbeliever won't say that unless he's one of God's children. One of the objects of God's fetching grace. Because the natural man will say, I know what I, know what I believe. I, I, they'll fight you tooth and toenail over what they believe. God's children live in Lodabar until he brings them to the king's table. A land where there is no pasture. And like that Philippian jailer who was managing a prison only to find out that he was himself the greatest prisoner of all. He was in prison to his own sin. What must I do to be saved? That was his cry. Why? Because the Spirit of God fetched him. Found him in nature, in Lodabar, brought the gospel to him through the Apostle Paul, and caused him to cry out for mercy. These stories are repeated over and over and over again every time one of God's people is fetched. It's fetching grace. And David said, the Lord is my shepherd. No longer do I live in Lodabar. No longer do I live in Lodabar. I shall not want, for he maketh me to lie down now in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. <laughs> what was the condition of 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 uh, we see we see who the object of God's fetching grace was Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, as are all the objects of God's saving grace. We see that he was sold under sin and that he was in a place where there was no bread, a place where there was no pasture. 
And we see something about his condition. He was crippled. He's crippled in both his feet. He couldn't walk. And back in chapter 4 of this same book, the scriptures tell us what happened. That the handmaiden of Jonathan's wife, after Jonathan had been killed and Solomon killed, she grabs up Mephibosheth as a five-year-old and flees. I can just ima- you can imagine the, 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 the confusion of what all's going on as the enemy's coming in to, to destroy any descendants that could be found. And, and she falls, and the fall is severe. And both the Mephibosheth's feet or ankles are broken or damaged in some way. And they were never repaired. And now he's old enough to have a child of his own, but he can't walk. Someone's got to carry him around. Reminded of that man at the gate called Beautiful who was not able to go in to the temple and worship God because he was crippled. And uh, Peter looked at him and said, Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give we unto thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand and walk. Well, he's begging for alms. He's begging for alms. That's where we are. A man for 38 years crippled at the pool of Bethesda. The Lord said, what are you doing here? What would you have me to do for you? Well, well, when the, water, when the angel comes and stirs the water, I've got no man to help me. Someone else always gets there before I do. I can't, I can't take care of him. I can't, I can't get there. And you and I are so spiritually crippled, we can't get to God. We can't walk to him. We can't stand in his presence. We can't run to him. We're crippled. As a result of what? As a result of the fall. And it was great confusion in that fall. This wasn't just a bruising of the knee in this fall or the crippling of of, of feet. This was a headlong fall that resulted in separation from God by our father Adam. And when Adam sinned, All sinned. Adam, you read that in Romans chapter 5. By one man's sin, they've all died. It's a great fall. Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or where do we get the knowledge of good and evil? From the law. Is that not where we get the law? The knowledge of good and evil from the law? There were two trees in the garden. It was the tree of life, and we know that that tree is Christ. And then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't touch that tree. Don't eat of that tree. In the same way that he told the children of Israel, don't touch that mountain, Mount Sinai. Any man that touches it, you will pierce him through with a lance. If an animal gets close to it and touches it, you kill him. The law cannot be approached. The law cannot be touched. The law is holy. Only the Lord Jesus Christ was able to fulfill the demands of the law. But Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's what you and I do. But there's another mountain besides Mount Sinai. It's called Mount Calvary. We flee to that mountain. And that's where we find the hope of one who himself is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. We have salvation in the one who was able to touch God's law without being condemned, without being defiled, without being judged. He lived perfectly by God's law. The law could find no fault in him until he was made sin on Calvary's cross. And then the law poured out its full judgment against him 
for the sins of the children of God. And I'm sorry we've gone over. I want to just close with this. This is so glorious. This is so glorious. Four times in this chapter, the scripture says, and Mephibosheth ate at the king's table all the days of his life. And when we go to Revelation chapter 19, we find that there's a a wedding feast. And the Lord Jesus Christ is there. And all those who have been fetched by his grace, all those that were in nature in the land of Lodabar, all the children of Jonathan, for the covenant's sake and for love's sake, have been brought into the kingdom of God. And they're all sitting at the wedding feast of the Lamb. And they eat at the king's table all the days of their life, which will never end. (laughs) Mephibosheth, sit here at my table. Ziba, you go out and you use your servants and you till the land and you take care of all that. Mephibosheth sitting at my table. I'm going to feed him. I'm going to provide for him. Child of God, if you've been fetched by grace, you get hungry a lot, don't you? That's the Spirit of God at work in you. You want to know God. You want to know Christ. You've not yet apprehended that which has apprehended you. You are always pursuing. Why are you doing that? Because God said, you're going to sit at my table all the days of your life. And we're sitting at his table right now. And every day of our lives, the Spirit of God causes us to come again and again and again. And hide our crippled feet under his tablecloth and eat the bread of life. The manna that came down from heaven and drink the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We eat of his flesh. And drink of his blood. We feast on him. All the days of our life. In this life. And in the life to come. Fetching grace. Oh how we need it. Tom you come please. And close us in with a hymn. 38 38 in the spiral hymnal. Let's stand together. power for some reason so we'll do this acapella number 38 <clears throat> come every sinner saved by grace you who by faith God's son embrace tell all who hear your voice below the debt of love to Christ you owe Dear Lord, I lift my praise to Thee, all that I am or hope to be. I owe alone, O Christ, to Thee. He 